This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, now accepting pre-orders for the all-new Ledger Blue Developer Edition, a Bluetooth and NFC touchscreen hardware signing device. Learn more about the Ledger Blue at ledgerwallet.com and use the discount code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with Eric Lombroso. He's the founder and CEO of Cyphrex, and it's kind of a long, long time, long standing uh, Bitcoin user, Bitcoin developer, and uh, also Bitcoin entrepreneur and Bitcoin wallet developer. And we have him on today to talk about segregated witness. Now, recently I was listening to a whole bunch of Bitcoin podcasts, and I also listened to and learned a bit about segregated witness. And I was like, I, I'm a little bit out of the loop with Bitcoin, which was I felt was a bit embarrassing. But also, this is really exciting, super exciting development and uh, project. So I'm, I'm glad we have a chance today to dive into Segregated Witness with Eric, who is also running, incidentally, the Segregated Witness uh, test network. So thanks so much for coming on today, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much. So... To, to get started, uh, can you tell us a bit about how you got into Bitcoin and what has your involvement in the space has looked like? Yeah, so um, I guess it was around 2011. Um, I was uh, at a party and some friends started telling me about Bitcoin and had some ideas for some games and I started you know, tinkering with it. And um, I pretty much uh, got hooked on it right away. And, and uh, that's basically what I've been doing ever since. Uh, so. I started building, uh, you know, some uh, some apps first, and then I realized that uh, there were some, you know, things that I would like to have as far as libraries or other kinds of tools, and I started building that, and and from that came Cypherx. I, I don't know what kind of parties you'd go to where people are talking about Bitcoin, but that was definitely a good uh, <laughs> a good party to be at. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so so how long have uh, have you been? Well, how how long ago have you founded uh, Cypherx? Cypherx got started. Uh, I mean, it was based on work that I've been doing since since I first got into Bitcoin. Um, but uh, the company itself was created in 2014, uh, and we incorporated uh, last year. And so we, we can talk a little bit more about Cypherx later. Now, uh, besides Cypherx, have you also been a contributor to, I think, Bitcoin Core, right? And, and mm -hmm. done yes. a variety of work. So how, how did you end up getting involved with the segregated witness uh, work? Well, I mean, I've been working with Peter Wheeler uh, quite a bit. Uh, he uh, he was one of the first people that I really worked with on on uh, you know when I first started contributing to Bitcoin Core, um, and uh, he uh, he'd been working on on this uh, you know segregated witness idea uh, for uh, for the you know sidechain stuff that he'd been doing with uh, with Blockstream, and that was uh, with um, you know the the, the Elements Alpha project. Uh, but it turned out that it was possible to deploy this on on the Bitcoin mainnet. Uh, with with a with a nice trick that was discovered uh, not too long ago. This this was uh, figured out uh, you know just a few months ago, and uh, I I uh, you know started uh, talking to him more about how we could actually deploy this and uh, you know whether it was actually practical to do so. And and it really started to look very promising. Uh, so after uh, you know there was the the Hong Kong Scaling Bitcoin conference uh, where uh, this uh, you know idea was kind of you know presented for the first time uh, completely and. Uh, you know, he'd already been working on some code, and I started grabbing the code and, and running it, and figuring out how how we could start, um, um, you know, building this test net so we could deploy it quickly, and we could start building apps. And I quickly started working on, on you know, my my own uh, my own applications. I have my wallet, Msigna, and I started uh, uh, trying to just you know play around with that and hook it up to that, and and yeah, so 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 here we are. And so when in in Hong Kong. Uh... How was it received uh, this uh, this proposal? I mean, it seems like everyone liked it. I mean, it was it was definitely a hit. It seems like there's there's very few people that think there's any kind of downside to it, really. I mean, it's just kind of like the best of all worlds. Uh, it solves so many problems that we've been trying to fix with the protocol. Uh, it really enables a lot of a lot of things that, uh, that that were really difficult to do before, if not impossible. Um, and it gives us a whole new mechanism for being able to really upgrade the protocol and deploy new stuff. Um, you know this whole extensibility framework, uh, which is really exciting because 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 you know it's really hard to change consensus rules, uh, and uh, th this gives us a, an opportunity to really be able to to you know set up the the the, 
um, to set up the system so that we can actually deploy things in the future in a way that's much more uh, um, much more systematic. So, so with that in mind, what is the segregated witness proposal? So uh, transactions have basically two components. One part is the part that actually that moves the coins. So it says, you know, coins that are in this part of the blockchain are now going to be in this part of the blockchain over here. And then there's the other part which authorizes the transaction. This contains the script and the signatures. Um, the script and the signatures are only used to, to validate the transaction, to make sure that the transaction is actually valid, uh, it's properly signed. Uh, once the coins have moved, uh, all that programs really care about is where the coins are and how, much coin, how many coins are there. So by separating this out, it allows us to optimize a lot of things about the, you know, the consensus uh, layer uh, and, and the protocol so, so that we can uh, do much more sophisticated kind of scripting. We can do much more uh, intricate you know, chaining of transactions. Uh, it solves the malleability issue. Uh, we can do much better uh, you know, uh, validation cost metric kind of stuff where it, it gives us much more freedom to, to extend the structure. And, and it allows us to, to, to do a lot of these stuff uh, with, with softworks. So this was a really... A uh, great thing because before uh, it was thought that a lot of these things uh, would require basically a, an incompatible change to the software. Where now, now we can actually deploy these things in a fully uh, backwards compatible way. So, do I understand that correctly, right? So, it, it, let's say you look at a transaction that happened, you know, a, a year ago or something like that. So, you see in the blockchain, you know, it went from these inputs to those outputs, and you also see in the blockchain, you know, the signature. But of course, you could say that, well, it's actually enough to just see that, uh, you know, the inputs and outputs back then, because a miner validated it back then, and sort of everybody has built on that. So, you know, we, we trust all, all that history, hence we, we actually don't need that signature from back then anymore. Right. So that's one thing we can do is, uh, you know, we can, we can do a lot of pruning. So ancient history can be pruned. Uh, you know, there, there's a certain uh, reduction of security, but uh, but it's you know, if you go back a year, it's going to be really really difficult for someone to you know to to reorg the the blockchain that far. So uh, you could pretty much safely throw away a lot of this stuff that's really old. Um, also, you might only be interested for you know for some transactions to store this data. Um, so so you could do selective pruning. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, you know interesting optimizations you can do with that. Yes. So what are some of the cases where you would want to save that data rather than discard it after a certain period of time or after it's been validated by miners? Well, if you want to be able to fully validate the blockchain, you're going to have to have this data. So someone on the network is going to want to store this data uh, just so that you can do full validation uh, if you don't want to have to do checkpointing. Um, so, so there is an incentive to keep this around for, for a long time. Uh, but you don't actually need this data to be able to, to construct transactions to spend the outputs from these other transactions. So uh, it doesn't affect any of the future logic. Once the transaction's in the blockchain, uh, it's, you know, it, it's uh, confirmed. Uh, basically, this data is, is no longer needed unless you wanted to, to validate for yourself. So th there's been a lot of work, I think, on, on pruning the blockchain already. Why is this different and why is this interesting? Well, to, to be honest, the, the pruning part of it is interesting, but that's, that's actually not the coolest feature of this. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff that we can do with this that's, that's much more interesting. This is just a, something that, uh, that's nice to have. Uh, it's nice to know that we can throw this data away, uh, but, but, but I'd rather get more into to the other features, which I think are, are what, more, what people are really excited about with Segregated Witness. Well, please, go ahead. Tell us what those features are. So the first feature that, that you know, one of the main motivations for it was uh, was fixing the malleability issue, right? So uh, transaction malleability is caused by the fact that uh, the, tr the transaction ID, the, the you know, the TX ID is a hash of the transaction. And the way that the system was originally designed, uh, the hash included the signatures, which means that if you change the signature, it would change the transaction ID. Uh, and uh, the way that the signature system works, uh, you can have different signatures that sign the same transaction. See, different signatures could be valid for the same transaction. So this makes it simple for someone to be able to malleate the transaction and uh, change the transaction ID without actually changing the inputs and outputs. So it, the transaction does the exact same thing, but it has a different ID. And, and this is a serious problem, especially if we want to go into uh, off-chain protocols where we want to be able to chain transactions. Uh, right now, if you want to, if you want to chain transactions, uh, you have to wait for one transaction to be signed before you can create the next transaction that spends that one. Because until you know the actual transaction ID, uh, you cannot you cannot sign the next transaction. You cannot refer back to the to the transaction that was that you're that you're spending. 
Um, when you when you take this out, when, when you take the signatures out of the transaction ID, uh, this means that you can actually sign transactions out of order. You can create a whole sequence of transactions um, and, and, and sign them in whatever order you want. Uh, and of course, unless the previous transactions are signed, the dependencies, you're not going to be able to, to confirm the later ones in the blockchain either. But this allows us to construct much more sophisticated logic where you can have transactions that have contingency conditions where, uh, you know, depending on what happened before, you know, whether certain transactions in the past get approved, uh, you know, you can have certain, uh, certain uh, you know, uh, ways of, uh, uh, you know, certain scenarios that you can make happen after that. And then this is very critical for certain uh, things like the Lightning Network. Uh, and, and, you know, off-chain protocol transactions, bi-directional payment channels, where you want to be able to uh, to be doing most of the the, the you know the, this uh, smart contract negotiation off-chain. You don't want to be uh, going on-chain every single time, and you want to make sure that you can uh, share transactions that are going to be spendable on the blockchain uh, without necessarily uh, signing them yet. So so people can be holding on to these transactions, ready to send you know to, to broadcast on the network if necessary. Uh, but it's just, you know, most of them will actually never actually get on the blockchain. Uh, it's just you have that option to, to get them on the blockchain. This allows us to have much more uh, flexibility in the logic that we can create with these uh, smart contracts. Okay, so you can, okay, I hadn't thought of that. So you could have a, a, you know, just a bunch of transactions that are chained, uh, well, chained, that, that are dependent of each other. So, for example, you could have... Uh, one address sending money to another and that address sending money to another and that address sending money to another and not sign them until you un until they need to be broadcast to the network and the fact that uh, there isn't that ability to change the transaction id uh makes that possible correct mm -hmm. exactly so so taking a, a step back can you run us through exactly how segregated witness works? So we've talked about, you know, separating the, the transactions from the signature. Like, how does that then play out? What is done with, with the signatures? What is done with the transactions? So uh, right now, transactions have scripts on both the inputs and the outputs. The, the input script is the one that usually contains the signatures. Uh, the output script is the one that contains the address. It's it's the it's what you're sending uh, you know coins to. It, it indicates uh, uh, you know where you're going to be sending the coins to. Uh, that one usually doesn't have the signatures. So uh, with with segregated witness, what we're doing is we're basically clearing the input scripts. The input scripts are no longer uh, going to be used as uh, you know uh, we're, we're moving all that data off to a different structure. Uh, which is which is um, which can be sent together with the transaction when it's relayed. When it's when it's broadcast on the network, it all goes together. But on the block itself, it's it's committed separately. So you have the the main Merkle tree for the transactions, uh, which is which, which is uh, you know, the root is stored in the block header the same way that it's working right now. And you have this other commitment, and this other commitment is just for the witness data. Uh, and and this witness data commitment um, is is uh, is something that that we can extend further later on. So so. Even though there's a block size limit with the with the block Merkle tree, uh, we can still add additional data to this other structure uh, that's committed separately, which 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 allows us uh, the flexibility to increase uh, you know certain things that, that that otherwise would have required a hard fork. So we can actually do this with a soft fork. So you said that, you know the data is sent together. Does that, so for example, uh, uh, let's say a regular Bitcoin node, would that mean I can choose as a node? whether I want to look at the, at the signature data and validate that, or I could say, uh, I'm just going to ignore that. Do you have, for example, that choice? Right. So if, you, if you're running a full node, uh, you'd want to validate everything. So you'd want to be receiving the whole thing. But uh, you only need to receive the transaction data itself and not the signatures if you want to know the state of the blockchain, if you're not doing any validation. Uh, so for instance, for SPV nodes, uh, they might not be, you know, uh, requesting all the signature. I mean, all the all the witness data, which contains the signatures. Uh, that would be enough to know that they received they received bitcoins, uh, and, and they would be able to look at their entire transaction history. Uh, if you want to validate, then you do need this data. Uh, but but the the key thing here is is that uh, is that even though it can be relayed together, uh, it's committed separately. So. Instead of committing all the transaction data into the same Merkle tree, you have two separate trees in the block. Uh, and, and this data can be committed in two separate uh, way, in two, two separate places, uh, which makes them independent. Uh, this, this allows us to to update the the witness data independently of the transaction data. 
And so just briefly, when you say, you know, they're both, you have two different Merkle trees in the block, what you mean is that, you know, this Merkle tree then deterministically links to all the witness data so that, you know, it's always clear what block and, and what witness data go together. Sure, sure, yes. And, and where is that put in the blockchain? So initially we were putting it in, uh, I mean, it, it has to go in the Coinbase transaction. This is an unfortunate uh, way that the way Bitcoin was designed. Uh, the block headers uh, don't have any more uh, uh, fields where we can stick stuff in. So the only place that really we can freely stick stuff in is the Coinbase transaction. You know, the first transaction where the, the miner actually gets the block reward. Uh, so the input of the, of the Coinbase is where uh, a lot of stuff used to be put in transactions and, and, and that, you know, the, the, that's something that's been uh, used for, for several uh, um, things like, like identifying uh, the, the, the mining pool sometimes puts their own uh, you know, identifier in there, uh, the block height is uh, stored in there, et cetera. Uh, but it turned out that, uh, that some miners, uh, some mining hardware had already been designed that made it hard to stick this data in there. Um, and so uh, we, we went for uh, putting it into, the, into one of the outputs. So there's actually an, an op return output in the Coinbase transaction. And this is where the commitment uh, for, the, for the Merkle root for the witnesses is stored. So, so basically, it's like a, an additional data field in, in the Coinbase transactions. So that means, you know, if you, if you talk about miners now, so if I'm mining uh, a block and, you know, I, I'm just not going to do that, that then means that, what does that exactly mean? Is it possible to, for example, you know, mine a block, but with transactions, but I don't put the Merkle root to the segregated witness uh, signatures in there? Well, once the software activates, you, uh, you, all miners have to include the, uh, the Merkle root. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's what makes it a soft fork. You know, blocks before didn't have to have this, and now it needs to have this. If it doesn't have this, it's not a valid block anymore. Uh, so, so as a miner, you would have to put the Merkle root for the witnesses in the, uh, in the Coinbase transaction for the block to be valid. So it would still be a valid block according to the you know current rules, right? It wouldn't be a valid block anymore mm -hmm. to the updated clients. Correct. Yes. If if it doesn't have the the uh, the Merkle root for the witness data. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other advantages uh, of this approach or uh, things that we can do with through segregated witness that we couldn't do before? Well, another really, really neat thing is that since we're moving the script data also into the witness, uh, this allows us to have an upgrade mechanism for the script. We can basically replace the entire script uh, with a new script. Before, it was thought that this was very, very difficult to do uh, without, without requiring a hard fork. This was because uh, you would have to uh, have, have new opcodes uh, that, that, uh, they, that could do other stuff with the stack rather than just you know uh, either... Uh, um, you know, succeed or fail. Uh, this means that that, that uh, we can have uh, opcodes that can add new uh, new functionality that that was very very difficult, if not impossible, to do before. Uh, we can basically replace the entire scripting language with with anything that we want. Okay, can you explain how this is possible? How does the signature relate to what type of scripts you can write? Right. So, uh, as I said before, the script. Uh, is stored in the input right now. It's part of the, the input of the transaction, but we're moving it out into the witness. So now the input is clear uh, to old nodes. It looks like a, like a, an anyone can spend transaction, right? This is the same mechanism that was used for, for BIP16 when multisig was rolled out. Um, so since, since it's an anyone can spend transaction for old nodes, uh, the new nodes can use whatever rules they want to, uh, to, to validate the transaction. Uh, so, so we've, we, it's, it's a nice little uh, way to, uh, to get around this, uh, this limitation. It allows us to, uh, to, to, to create any kind of script. The old nodes are, are, are going to basically just ignore that script. They're not going to look at it and they're going to consider it valid. Uh, the, the, the new nodes are, are going to be able to, you know, look at the script and, and, and run the script and, and we can put whatever we want there now. So, so uh, the, the first version of this is just going to be the, the script that we have now, the scripting language that we have now. But in the future, we're looking at adding other kinds of opcodes or other kinds of scripts. Uh, you know, some of the opcodes that, that we're looking at adding are, are, are new kinds of signature types. You know, we're looking at the Schnorr signatures um, and uh, other kinds of, uh, uh, you know, interesting uh, um, 
in interesting things that, that, that we can do with uh, – another thing that we can do is opcodes that, that, can, that can manipulate the stack in ways that we couldn't do right now. Right now, we have all these new opcodes that were added that, that are all just uh, verify, you know, check lock time verify. Um, these these opcodes uh, can you know basically are either uh, no ops or or they exit uh, you know with with an error they basically exit false uh, with with a uh, with, with segwit we can move we, since we can uh, create new opcodes that uh, that uh, don't need to be executed by the by the um, old clients uh, this gives us a full flexibility to be able to create opcodes that do whatever we want. Uh, so, so this is a really, really neat thing. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's like, what could we do with it? Well, pretty much anything. I mean, it's 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 a whole new uh, dimension of, of you know of, of uh, uh, you know of, of ideas that we can really explore here. So, by taking the script and moving it out of the block and into this this witness part, what you're essentially doing is you're allowing nodes to choose to to create new codes that would be. Um, that would be run sort of as a soft fork. Is is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so when we want to add a new, uh, when we want to deploy a new scripting language or a new opcode, uh, it would be done as a soft fork. And so the script has a, a, a version byte, uh, which which tells you what uh, you know which uh, which version it is. And so every single time we want to deploy a new one, we just bump that version up. And now we can have a completely different, uh, you know, a different scripting language with different opcodes, and you know, do whatever we want with that. Okay, so then nodes that would understand, nodes that choose to run this new scripting language could, and others would simply ignore it. Yeah, they would just ignore it and just return true. Okay, so could you give us an, an example of how this would work? Uh, and by that I mean, so if some group wanted to try new functionalities and implement new opcodes, what would they have to do? How, like, they would have to update their clients, I suppose. Right, so uh, for this to be deployed, uh, it would have to be uh, deployed as a soft fork, which means that you would have to propose it, uh, implement the code, uh, put it out there, and, and then use an activation mechanism. So right now we use uh, 95% for, for, uh, for activation. So as soon as 95% uh, of miners signal that they support this new feature, uh, that triggers the change and and it locks it in. So after that point, uh, uh, you need to you need to also validate that if you want to make sure that the block is valid. Let's take a short break so we can go to Paris. I stopped into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, at the Ledger offices, and I met with Ledger CEO Eric Larchevec so he could tell me all about the Ledger Wallet Chrome app. The Ledger Wallet Chrome app is a perfect companion app for your Ledger HW1 or Nano. We have very powerful and cool features. You can use multi-accounts, for instance, personal accounts, business accounts. This is very useful. Also, when you want to make a transaction, we use a second factor of verification. You can either use a physical security key or cryptographically securely pair your Android or iOS smartphone to your Nano. This way, when you issue a transaction, a payment, the transaction will pop up on your Android or iOS phone and you will be able to verify the amount and destination address. Finally, the Ledger Chrome app has an API with which you can easily integrate third-party applications. For instance, if you want to create a multi-signature account with CoinKite or Copay, it will be done using the Ledger Wallet Chrome app. Ledger is making hardware wallets easy and convenient without compromising on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So, so you mentioned BIP16, uh, and how does that compare with BIP16? So BIP16 was, was also a soft fork? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the difference here is that well, with BIP sixteen there wasn't a, a version bit, right? So there's no like different things, and also, uh, how else does it compare to, to how multisig was implemented? Yeah. So the multisig opcodes actually already existed. Uh, Satoshi put them in there from the beginning, but there was no simple way to use it. Uh, we have this, uh, you know. BIP16 basically uh, um, was was paid a script hash. It allowed us to, instead of paying to a Bitcoin address, which is a hash of a public key, uh, it allows us to pay to a hash of a script. And the script can be anything. So this this gives us much more generality. So so um, 
it was also a soft fork because because uh, to old nodes it looks like anyone can spend. So basically, these transactions, uh, you know, the the the, the whole uh, script that that is hashed is not actually executed by the old nodes. The new nodes do have to execute that, and they check to make sure that it does return true. Um, but with SegWit, uh, it's not just that the script executes; it's that you can actually define different kinds of scripts. You can add a new kind of script, uh, and and uh, to the old nodes, it would just be like you know, it's it's uh, they would ignore it, like you said. Uh, they wouldn't uh, um, they wouldn't know how to evaluate it, so they would just ignore it and return true. Uh, the new nodes can can uh, can can interpret it using the new uh, the new semantics. Right, but so you could really have used the same mechanism back when uh, you know pay the script hash was implemented to do you know, some other things that are more complicated, maybe some of the things we're talking about now with, with segregated witness. Yeah, actually that's true. Um, there, there was a, an opportunity there to maybe uh, do some stuff. Um, unfortunately at the time, uh, it wasn't really, uh, you know, people were not thinking that far ahead as far as, uh, um, you know, these kinds of um, deployment mechanisms. It was really for the, you know, the, the main, uh, the main objective there was, was the multi-sig stuff, uh, you know, to, to be able to, to, to use that and to be able to, to uh, deploy, uh, to, to use other kinds of scripts that used to be non-standard, uh, to make them standard uh, by uh, um, being able to use a, a P to SH, a pay to script hash to be able to um, have these transactions relayed. So, so I don't think back then really people were thinking about, uh, um, but, but, but you're right. I mean, in principle, there, this kind of mechanism could be used for something like that. It's very, it's very similar. I mean, SegWit uses a very, very similar mechanism. Right. Very interesting. So I, I saw someone mention that you know this could be used for Bitcoin to implement like Ethereum-like scripts. What could that look like? Can you have like a sort of full-blown uh, smart contract language there? Well, yeah. I mean, in principle, you could do uh, you know. A lot of things. Uh, if the Ethereum scripting language has a uh, much more uh, state space. You know, it's it's much more stateful. It, it has a um, it, it's uh, it's it's got an execution environment that's uh, much more complex uh, than than Bitcoin. Um, you know, it's got this whole random access uh, you know model that uh, that makes it a much much more uh, complex to uh, to to optimize and to make it actually uh, you know uh, run fast and scale and all that. So I think that with Bitcoin, really the um, the focus is on trying to uh, to use the scripts mostly for the cryptographic stuff. Uh, there's all, there's other stuff that, that's also included in the scripts that you know there, there's a there's time locks and hash locks and stuff like that. But uh, the idea is, um, I mean, in principle, you could have much more sophisticated scripts, but we're really trying to find ways to to not extend it to the point where it's really really um, you know too uh, too resources intensive and it makes it really really hard to scale this. You will still have the the ten minute block then, right? Or could you have some sort of like, uh, you know, sub blocks that you know maybe are more frequent only in that segregated part, but only you know there, there's kind of the money movement remains at the the regular Bitcoin block interval. Would something like that be possible? Uh, well, I mean, I I don't think that with this proposal right now, uh, you know, we're, we're really looking to do something like that. Uh, in principle, I mean, there's been several proposals for for those kinds of uh, you know um, uh, you know side blocks or you know ghost or, or other kinds of uh, schemes. I, I don't. Uh, I I think that uh, you know most likely we're not going to be looking to do anything like that in the very near future. So we we identified a list of things here that are made possible by this and um, some of the other improvements that it can offer is uh, is something called fraud proofs for uh, SPV clients. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah, sure. So in the original Satoshi white paper, uh, it was mentioned that SPV clients, uh, um, if there was a way to have fraud proofs, it would improve the security because it would only require one whistleblower on the entire network to notice that a block is uh, is invalid, and then all SPV nodes could know to ignore that block. So right now, if you're running an SPV client, uh, you you get a block that confirms a transaction, and uh, unless you uh, are, are able to validate the block, you just accept you know accept the transaction's confirmation because the rest of the network seems to think it's okay. 
Um, but of course, miners uh, might not be, you know, they, they could be cheating or, you know, they could uh, be running buggy software. Uh, this has actually happened before where miners are not validating correctly. Uh, and then SPV clients are going to see confirmations that are not actually real. Uh, so this is this is an issue which which Satoshi uh, considered fixing. You know, a potential fix would be if if it's possible to make it so that you know if, even if proving that the block is valid uh, is expensive, it, it still requires downloading the whole block and checking it. Maybe making it so that proving that the block is invalid could be made uh, cheap. So you could have a very short proof uh, that demonstrates that the block is invalid. And if you could create this. Uh, that means that it will only take one node on the entire network to, to, you know, to construct this proof and propagate it, and then all the nodes would know uh, immediately to, uh, to uh, ignore this. Uh, but uh, there, there's, a, there's a significant problem with this, which is that uh, it, it requires extreme uh, censorship resistance. Like, for instance, if you're connected through your ISP and your ISP decides to uh, block these messages, uh, th there could be potential attacks there. Uh, it's just, so, so it requires, uh, you know, it requires more security assumptions. But on the other hand, uh, it does mean that, uh, um, you know, the, the incentives model shifts more towards, you know, people actually wanting to validate because it's more likely, or, you know, validating correctly because uh, it, it, it's easier for someone to, uh, um, it, it's harder for someone to get away with it. So, so just the knowledge that if you tried to do this, it'd be harder for you to get away with. It could make it so that people are less inclined to try it. So, um, so, so, so fraud proofs are a really interesting thing. Uh, they still have a lot of problems in principle, and I think that you know some of these, these things could potentially be fixed uh, with with the original way that the, the Bitcoin was implemented. Uh, th this was something that, that seemed very, very difficult to do because uh, if you want to check whether a block is invalid, you need to have partial proofs for different things. You need to be, be able to check, for instance, that the, the Coinbase transaction that doesn't, uh, doesn't pay the miner too much, that the fees are correct in all the transactions, uh, that, that all the transactions spend coins that actually exist, et cetera, so, you know, that the signatures are valid. So if you can separate all these different checks and make it so that uh, you, know, you can prove that any particular one of them failed, uh, that would be enough for a fraud proof. So, for instance, if you can just prove that one of the signatures in the transactions is invalid and that's necessary, that's enough to show that the whole entire block is invalid. Or if you can prove that the miner paid uh, paid himself too too much in fees, that also is able to prove right away that the that the block is invalid. Uh, so, uh, with with Segwit, we can we can do this because now that we have this extensible commitment structure, the second Merkle tree, uh, we can insert there additional data about the transaction. Uh, about the transaction inputs in particular, that allows us to uh, to, to do uh, back references where we can actually see where the coins came from and use that to to prove to, to construct short proofs that, for instance, a particular coin that was spent doesn't actually exist. You can actually go back in the blockchain and, and look in that location, and if the coin that's supposed to be there is not there, then you know that that block is invalid. So so this is how it, this is how it lets us do these kinds of things. Uh, but but I, I should note that. For the first release of SegWit, uh, we won't be doing fraud proofs right away. This is uh, this is something that's for for some potentially some, some later release. Uh, one of the nice things is with this uh, with this um, extensible structure, um, it allows us to to do incremental deployments. We don't need to put all the features and pack them in right away. Uh, we can we can uh, you know uh, put the features in later on as we have already tested the whole system and and you know we've done more more research and figured out what, how we can actually do this. So so just just. Uh... A little bit more on the, the fraud proof question. Um, how exactly would that work? So who, now I'm, I'm a miner, I'm, I'm mining a block and you know, I'm also, there's also this uh, extended segregated witness data with all the, the signatures. Where would I include a fraud proof in there that relates to, to who? Or how exactly would that work? So what would happen with the, with the fraud proof is that you need to have a commitment structure that can track the stuff necessary for someone to construct the, the fraud proof. The, the commitment itself would not have the fraud proof. In, in, in a valid block, you don't have a fraud proof because there's no fraud, right? Uh, the fraud proof is constructed when, when a block is created and propagated on the network that is invalid. So someone would look at the block and, 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 and see and, and run all the tests to, make, to validate the block. And if any of those tests fail, uh, they would be able to point to exactly what failed and how it failed by, by, by uh, you know, using that commitment structure. For instance, uh, if the commitment structure stores the, the input values, right? So it knows exactly how much uh, the, you know, each, uh, each particular input spent 
and it knows the output values, then you could calculate the fees from that. You can see that the fees actually add up correctly and the miner is not paying him or herself too much in fees, right? Okay. So, 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 so do I understand that correctly? Basically, right today with a block, like I can validate it. I may see that there is something invalid about that block, but the problem is I can't like prove to someone else very, like very easily that it's something invalid because of the way Bitcoin blocks are constructed. But right. now with segregated witness, we can think ahead and you can say, okay, let's construct the segregated witness data in a way that makes it really easy to prove if something is invalid so I can submit that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's very neat. So let's talk about one of the other uh, uh, advantages of, of moving to segregated witness, and, and that is addressing, in part, the scalability issue. Now, it addresses it by allowing us to add more transactions into a block, because essentially, as we remove the signature part and move, to, move it to some other data structure, those, those transactions are much smaller in terms of the data footprint, uh, and, uh, and essentially, we can fit more transactions into a one megabyte block. Um, now, you mentioned that that wasn't the, the, the biggest advantage, although to some it may seem like such a huge thing because we've been talking about block size for so long and trying to, sure. to come up with solutions on how to put more transactions into a block without affecting uh, decentralization, uh, without affecting like having too much bandwidth go through to, to miners. Um, can you describe to us like, so, you know, in broadly what what segregated witness brings in terms of scaling Bitcoin to have more transactions in the block and, and what are some of the pros and cons of that solution? Sure. So, I mean, short term, yeah, I mean, growing the block size can provide more throughput. You can stick more transactions in a block. But long term, that's not going to be a viable scaling solution because if you want to you know, scale this to, to global size, uh, we're talking you know, several orders of magnitude. It's not just going to be two times or four times or 20 times. And we have to scale this up a thousand times to, to compete with you know, the large payment networks right now or more. Right. So to be able to, to reach these kinds of numbers, uh, the block size alone is probably not going to be able to get us there. But at least in the short term, it does provide a bump. And I know that a lot of people in the industry have been kind of craving this bump because, uh, you know, allows them to to, to at least, uh, you know, uh, ho hold on you know a bit longer until we have better technology. Uh, but I think that. Um, you know, the, the neat thing about doing this with, with SegWit is, uh, the, you know, the compatibility aspect. It, it doesn't require people, everyone to upgrade right at the same time. Uh, it's not going to uh, fork the blockchain. Uh, it, it converges. You still have a single blockchain, and uh, it, it allows people to, to upgrade incrementally, um, and uh, it, it's, it's backwards compatible. So, so these things mean that uh, it, it's, it's much, much safer to deploy this than, than, to, than to deploy a hard fork uh, block size increase. If we just increase the block size uh, you know, by, by changing a constant in the code, uh, yes, it's, it's easier from the perspective of uh, you know, fewer lines of code that need to be changed, but it's much more of a hassle in terms of uh, the, the network stability. It actually causes uh, some very, very severe problems uh, in network stability, both on the technical and the political levels, as, as we've been seeing recently. Uh, and this is a direct result of, of, of changing something that makes it uh, non, not backwards compatible. So, so the backwards compatibility aspect is, is huge. Uh, this means that uh, you know, it gives us a much, much, much bigger safety, you know, safety margin. And, and it's something very similar to what we've already done before, like we saw with BIP16 with the multi-sig stuff. Uh, and then that was deployed very, very uh, safely. Uh, you know, no, no incidents there. Uh, multi-sig is super secure. Everything's working fine. Uh, th this is, uh, you know, something where, where we discovered that we can actually get, you know, an effective block size increase uh, without breaking old clients. Uh, and this is huge. This is something that, that uh, uh, means that it gives us a, a roadmap that, that can lead us to, uh, to having, you know, a short-term bump. And also, it gives us the other features that, that I talked about, particularly the malleability stuff. If you fix the malleability issue, uh, this allows the development of, of second layer networks, so, so like Lightning Network and off-chain protocols. And once you start the innovation there, uh, you can have a lot more, uh, uh, you know, several orders of magnitude scaling in the sense that uh, no longer does everything need to be propagated on, on, on the Bitcoin network, uh, you know, for, through, throughout all the peers, not all the peers need to know of all transactions. You can actually have you know, smart contracts negotiated directly 
point to point between different peers, and and, and they only need to commit. You know, they only need to settle uh, at the end of the. You know, once everything happens. So if a whole bunch of transactions happen on the network, and and, and the net, you know, they, they all net out to zero, uh, nothing needs to happen on the blockchain. Um, you know, only what, whatever is net out from that needs to be committed to the blockchain. Uh, so uh, the malleability fix allows us to uh, to really. Um, you know, start looking at other kinds of approaches that, that I think are really what people are much more excited about than just the block size increase. Of course, people want block size increases. We've been talking about it forever, and we still get that. We're still going to get. I mean, it's not it's not just the virtual block size increase. It's a real block size increase. Uh, it's just that uh, we're, we're not increasing uh, the the block just you know the same portion of the block all together. We're we're separating out a, a part of it which is which is being counted differently, uh, which which makes it back which allows us to make it backwards compatible. Right. So if you think about scaling, because because the thing people have always been worried about when it comes to increasing the block size, and I think the most convincing argument was always that this actually creates uh, centralization pressure for miners because uh, bandwidth you know plays a big role. So if they you know blocks propagate more slowly, it helps big miners. Now here that doesn't really change anything, right? So if you had like a three megabyte block that you know. The core block plus the secondary witness part, you know, that's really equivalent from a sort of decentralization perspective as if it was, you know, just a three megabyte block. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, that's that's true. And so basically, we have a choice now. We can either do this segwit thing, which is going to have the same uh, bandwidth implications, or uh, we could try to to actually, you know, do a hard fork. Uh, but the, 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 you know, the hard fork is just going to be a bump, I mean, immediate bump. It's not going to give us any of the other scaling benefits, and it has all the destabilization uh, issues, you know, with the, especially with the political stuff and, and the potential for, for future attacks, you know, contentious hard forks, people in the future deciding that they want to try to control the consensus rules and, you know, jumping in with, with, with you know, trying to, trying to get all miners to, to do something and basically forcing people to, to, to move to a different network. Um, so, so... So, so, so we're really trying to avoid situations that, that are conducive to that kind of dynamic because, uh, you know, if, if you really think about the, the implications of that, uh, it, it doesn't bode very well for, for, for the network, you know, for, for the, for the long-term stability of the network. So I, I honestly never really understood that argument because it seems to me that, you know, if you looked at like BIP 101 or something like that, right, you had that mechanism that you had to have a, a, a large majority of miners, uh, you know, agree to it. And then you had like a fairly long uh, period where, you know, they had agreed, so it was clear it was going to happen, but it, it wasn't happening yet. So it essentially give, you know, people on the network a long time to upgrade their clients. Now... Uh, why is that such a risk? Well, it's a risk because uh, you know what if it what if it doesn't reach the ninety five percent? What if it stays like at fifty percent for a while, or you know sixty percent or seventy percent? You know, it's it's a lot of uncertainty, uh, and and once uh, it, it it breaks one way or the other, uh, you're talking about two incompatible uh, ledgers basically. Uh, uh, people that, that did not want to change into the new rules are, are going to be forced to to um, either change to the new rules or are, are going to be uh, thrown off the network. With a soft fork, uh, you, uh, you 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 need you have better security if you upgrade, but you're only adding more rules. You're not changing. You're not eliminating any of the old rules that you had before. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's the, the the dynamics make it much harder for any single entity to come in. The most important factor here is um, that it, it will always converge. You always have convergence with a soft fork. Uh, as long as there's a, there's, you know, a super majority of miners, uh, one of the chains is always going to be the, def, the, the main chain. In the case of a hard fork, uh, even if there's only this 5% that kind of like, you know, don't change, uh, uh, the, peop the users of that network might not necessarily even know that, that there was a fork and uh, they might see just like the hash rate suddenly drop Right, and uh, it could be much more easily attacked. Uh, so, I, I think uh, uh, you know what we're seeing right now is is is, is a situation where uh, people people can can do a lot of posturing and 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 and, and you know kind of like uh, give the impression that there's going to be a, a, a majority of you know of hash power on, on a particular uh, fork, uh, but but maybe they they'll play a different way. You know, people don't have to tell the truth. They, 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 you know, when, when you're when you're uh, signaling that you're going to be forking. Uh, Miners don't necessarily need to indicate which fork they're going to do, and there's a lot of 
loopholes there and, and, and potential attack vectors that happen there because it, once you have these two different uh, forks that, that, that coexist, um, you know, you can double spend one of them and, you know, without risking losing the coins in the other. So you can have like these kinds of situations where, where the two chains, you know, can, can kind of be, you know, fighting against each other. Or you might even have, you know, more than two parties, more than two different uh, sets of consensus rules that, that are being put on the network. And, and it just, it doesn't seem like it's a very stable, you know, it, it doesn't lead to stability. Okay. So, you know, this all seems really great. I mean, all these things that you can do with segregated witness seem like pretty pretty like a big breakthrough right you know um what are some of the security implications are are there any downsides to doing this um well um it, it does increase the, the the bandwidth requirements uh, and 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 you know since it's a since it's a more uh, uh, dynamic kind of limit it depends on on, on the sum of both the you know, the non uh, witness part and the witness part of the transaction now, there could be situations where you could get blocks that are a little bit bigger uh, in attack scenarios but I think that that's that's something that, uh, that that's still very costly to pull off uh, it's considered to be uh, you know uh, kind of like those uh, cases where where just you know the, the the cost of the attack is is substantial, which which uh, which greatly disincentivizes it. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, you know some people might be concerned with uh, with things like um, the, you know the the, the degradation of, of security uh, of other nodes. Um, and I, I would just say that uh, you know in any kind of uh, consensus uh, rule change, there's always an inherent risk. And we, this has happened every single time that we've deployed softworks, and we've already done it, you know, several times. And, and actually, now we've actually gotten softworks down to a science. So, so it's something that uh, I think you know we've gotten it pretty much about as safe as, as we can possibly get it. Uh, you know, get any kind of a consensus rule a deployment. Uh, um, and, and I think that uh, um, I mean, obviously, with any new thing that we're doing, there's always possibilities that there could be some issues. But we're, we're running tests. You know, we're we're, we're, uh, we're making sure to. Uh, to, to run a barrage of tests to try to you know make sure that uh, that, that everything uh, works as, as intended. So regarding tests, you you're, you've set up a test net. Um, yes. How many how many how many nodes do you have? How many people are running tests uh, on this on this new test net? Um, I believe hmm. I I believe it's like you know maybe. 10 to 20 nodes on the, I have, I have to check right now. I, I actually don't have the exact number. Uh, it's been a couple of days and a lot more people have been joining. So I, I don't know the exact number, but uh, it's, it's been growing. It's been growing a lot. And I think that, um, you know, I mean, it's still small. It's still mostly for developers. So we've gotten a lot of the, the wallet developers and a lot of the, the library developers to start tinkering with it. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they seem to be uh, enjoying it. And uh, so, so I, I think, uh, um, you know, there, there's also, um, um, there, there's, um, you know, there's also the need to do more stress testing and see exactly like, how, you know, if we can push the limits to see like if, the, if anything is, uh, you know, if, if there's any issues with with, uh, with the other aspects of the system that, that, that could possibly break, potentially break. Uh, but, but everything has been running really smoothly until now. I mean, there hasn't been any issue. So uh, we're, we're very optimistic that we'll be able to roll this out onto mainnet, uh, you know, pretty shortly. Today's magic word is witness, W-I-T-N-E-S-S. -S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. You, you mentioned a wallet developer, you're a wallet developer yourself. What does that mean for, you know, let's say wallet developers that want to use seg segregated witness transactions? This is a big change. It's actually not that big of a change. Uh, the wallet developers that we've worked with, you know, were able to implement it within a couple of days, you know, less than a week. Uh, it's, it's something that is not very, very difficult at all. Uh, it does require some changes. Uh, it's it's uh, it's something which some of the so some people in in, in this space have kind of you know. Uh, we're hoping that they wouldn't have to change anything, but I think that as far as changes go, this is a very, very minor change. Uh, it, it does require uh, having to uh, recognize this uh, this uh, witness data and 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 look at the signatures in there. But this also makes it much simpler to develop a lot of uh, you know better uh, applications, and especially in like the multi-sig space, uh, multi-sig transactions uh, 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 with SegWit. Are much cleaner in a lot of ways. It allows us to to, to stick the signatures into the structure uh, in in a way which uh, which 
which is which is much much cleaner than the way, the way we're doing it right now. So so I think that the, the, the benefits for for you know, and also with with uh, with, with multi sig transactions the um, the throughput increase is, is greater than with uh, with the non multi sig transactions. So uh, once we uh, I, th I think that there's a lot of uh, um, I don't think that it's something that was really, really that complicated to do. It took, you know, as I said, you know, most wallet and library developers have been able to integrate most of this stuff in, in, in a couple of days. Okay, it's really interesting. So what does it look like? Uh, it's, it seems like there's a kind of universal uh, support for this or, you know, very strong support, which is an extremely rare thing in, in Bitcoin land. You know, it is, uh, generally people disagree on most things. So what, what's 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 the plan now? Uh, what's the roadmap, and when can we expect this to be integrated? Well, I mean, a lot of the the, the libraries are are already you know they're, they're, it's in a pretty advanced state of of, uh, of integration. Uh, once these libraries are, are are you know have these um, are are integrated, then applications that use these libraries can start integration, uh, and, and so the whole ecosystem can 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 uh, can upgrade that way. Uh, we think that we are probably going to be able to deploy something onto mainnet. Uh, you know, we're hoping by, by April to have something, something deployable at least. Uh, yeah, so at this point, it would just be the code that, that's, need, that's necessary to, to activate it. It wouldn't actually activate until there's a minor supermajority, 95%, which can happen anywhere from a few weeks to a couple months down the line from that. Uh, we're hoping that, it, you know, that we'll see very quick adoption uh, and, and we're hoping that, uh, you know, people can can immediately start uh, making use of the new features of this, and, and we're really excited about the uh, you know the, the the new kinds of stuff that we can start building, especially the second layer stuff is going to be really really exciting because that that really you know once we start getting into the second layer protocol stuff, uh, we really remove a lot of the innovation out of the the consensus layer, which means that a lot of the politics go away. We we don't have to deal so much about arguing about you know how we're going to change uh, consensus rules and forks and all this stuff. Uh, there can be competing. Uh, networks that, that can be exploring different ideas uh, without breaking everything for everyone. Uh, you can have two different lightning networks that use completely different structure types or whatever. Um, as long as the consensus layer is the same, uh, it, no problem. I mean, the, you know, we obviously want to standardize these things for, for the whole network at some point, but it allows us to really experiment with these things without breaking the network. And so what is your, uh, so we were talking about this earlier and it, it, once once miners uh, agree to to implement Siri witness and we start having um, wallets and, and libraries implementing this uh, it, it, is the is the ambition for everybody at one point at some point to start using segregated witness transactions to move to yes. segregated witness transactions or do you think part of the network will use the old type transaction and part of the network will use seg witness? Well, for a while, there's going to be both. I mean, not all the wallets are going to upgrade right away. Um, old wallets are going to work fine. They're not going to need to do anything to be able to, to send and receive transactions. You can send transactions from a, from a SegWit wallet to a non-SegWit wallet without a problem and vice versa. Uh, you want to upgrade to SegWit for, uh, for, for all the features that, that it offers, though. So I think that there's a lot of uh, economic incentives just built into this already. Uh, people are going to want to do it because it's just you know it makes it it makes it possible for them to to give better products to their users. So uh, this in itself provides the incentive for people to 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 you know be uh, to be doing this. And I think that uh, once uh, once we uh, have enough people really uh, using this, uh, you know, it's everyone's going to want to use it at some point. Uh, how long that'll take, I don't know. I mean, at, at P 2 sh when we when we first deployed a, a, you know, a pay to script hash, it took a while until people started to to you know adapt to the to the new address types. Here, you actually don't need to have new address types. Uh, everything is fully a, a P 2 sh address compatible, uh, which are the addresses that start with three in Bitcoin. Uh, so so any wallet that can send to those addresses can send to a Segwit wallet without any modification right now. Uh, and so we're going to probably see a, a, a time period where where you know, there's going, to be, there's going to be a mix. There's going to be a hybrid. Not everyone's going to upgrade. Uh, but I think as soon as people really start to see the benefits, they're all going to want to migrate to this. And hopefully it won't take that long. I mean, hopefully it'll, take mu it'll be much quicker than, than the migration that, you know, to, to, to multi-sig and, and pay to script tasks that, we, that we've you know, still been taking a while. And, and there's also an, an incentive uh, in terms of transaction fees, right? Because as, sure. as uh, we mentioned earlier, transactions will be smaller. You can fit more transactions into a block, which... 
uh, implies that transaction fees should be less. Can you tell us a bit more about how this mechanic yeah, works? Yeah, correct, correct. I mean, you know, in principle, you know, um, th that this means that, uh, you know, the, the, the transaction footprint itself in the block is going to be smaller. Miners can fit more of these transactions in a block. So, so yes, this means that the fees in principle can be lower. So this, this could be another advantage. Right now, fees are still a very uh, small part of, uh, of, of the minor, uh, uh, you know, the, the minor rewards. Is, you know, the, the subsidy is still the, the vast majority of, of, the, of the minor reward. So uh, if we start to see more, uh, you know, competition for fees, uh, you know, and, and prioritization of transactions based on fees, uh, we could expect this to definitely be a significant uh, you know, um, economic incentive. Um, I, I think that uh, the, 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 the initial incentives are probably going to be more just the fact that wallets that support this can offer much cooler stuff for their users. Uh, but definitely, yes, I mean, uh, the, the, the fees are definitely going to be going to be lower. So I have another question that uh, right now, one of the challenges that, that I see, right? So if you have different clients, so, or one of the problems with Bitcoin, you know, in my view, is that there is this kind of one client and it's it's really hard to make like have a variety of clients because there's a you know there's a risk there's some sort of consensus bug and then you know they'll they'll diverge and so so you have a strong incentive as a user to be sort of on the main client is it possible that segregated witness would help there to have it more possible to have you know different implementations of bitcoin at the same time well for that to happen I think we really need to separate out the consensus code itself. We're working on, on, on a consensus library. Um, SegWit could potentially help modularize some aspects of it, perhaps. Uh, modularization here would be key. If you can modularize these things and, and have libraries that, that implement these different consensus rules, uh, you can have different uh, applications reuse the same code, uh, which is going to, you know, in principle, behave the same way. And so, so, yeah, one of the issues with consensus code, right, is that uh, you have to replicate even the same bugs. So, so if, if two different programs uh, uh, have any, any kind of uh, divergence in behavior, uh, it's not which one is correct in, 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 in the strict sense. It, it's, it's, you know, which one is, uh, uh, you know, w whether they agree or not. And, and, if, and you know, this happened in, in, the, in, in the fork in, when was it, uh, 2013, was it, where uh, uh, the, 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 the rule, the official consensus rules were actually not adhered to because it turned out that uh, the majority of the economic, uh, you know, the economically important nodes were still using an older version uh, that, that, that broke with the new rules. So, so, uh, so this is kind of an interesting situation where um, you, uh, you really cannot uh, uh, just expect to have all these implementations to, to you know, to work side by side unless they can be rigorously tested against each other. This is a very, very major issue. I think that uh, segregated witness is probably not going to solve this in and of itself. Uh, I'm hoping that it encourages more modularization in general somehow. Um, I'm, I'm, I think that uh, you know, breaking out the consensus layer and uh, really working on, on, on developing a solid implementation for that and, and letting other applications uh, reuse that uh, would probably be the way to go. OK, very interesting answer. Now, this sort of ties into the larger block size debate, at least partially. I, I get that there's a lot of other things going on here. Uh, what is your view on that? I, I take it you are uh, have a lot of concerns about hard forks, right? And so would favor uh, an approach like this. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, unfortunately, the, the whole block size thing got... Um, conflated with, with you know, a lot of different issues. And I think there was a lot of misunderstanding. I think that a lot of the, the, um, the non-technical community and, and, and you know, the public uh, were not really uh, witnessing exactly the whole uh, uh, you know, development in, in the, in, as far as the, what the developers were, were doing. Um, you know, way back in, in, in May, we were already talking about you know, considering these ideas uh, when, when, when it was first proposed to the mailing list. And people were actually really you know, trying to pick this apart and figure out all the things that could possibly go wrong. Uh, and, and it quickly became apparent that, that hard forks have very, very significant uh, stability issues uh, and, and significant, uh, you know, they, they can potentially open up uh, attack vectors, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, things that they could be very dangerous for the network. So, so I am very concerned about hard forks. That's not to say that it's impossible to do a, a hard fork, you know, more safely. Um, I think that the only way that that's viable is if there isn't this kind of... Uh, you know, contentiousness. If you don't have, uh, you know, a lot of polarization and, and people kind of, you know, fighting 
with, with different things. If, if, if most of the network agrees on something, if something's pretty, you know, much uncontroversial, that's fine. Um, as far as the block size itself, I don't really think that there was much issue with, with, with bigger blocks. I don't think that, you know, many of the core devs actually said, no, we, we should never have bigger blocks. I mean, I think for the most part, the, the, you know, the, 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 the uh, idea of having bigger blocks is something that you know, was appealing. We should find a way to be able to have bigger blocks. We all want to have bigger blocks. But uh, just increasing the, the blocks by, by changing a constant in the code uh, presents a lot of very, very serious problems. So uh, it turns out that uh, if we want to do this and, and do it safely, uh, we probably have to uh, retrofit some stuff and, and, and do a lot more risk mitigation. Uh, which is what we're trying to do with this. I think that, that with SegWit, we kind of get you know the best of both worlds. I mean, yeah, it's not a single constant change in the code. It does actually require a little bit of, of modification of applications, but it's, it's not a very significant uh, modification. And uh, it, it, it's much safer from all the other uh, aspects of it. You know, it, it really uh, it does not cause all the stability issues uh, that, that just uh, you know changing this constant does. So uh, you know, I think that uh, to get back to the whole block size thing, Block size was never really the, the issue. That, that was never really what people were, were arguing about. It was much more about this hard fork thing, you know, whether we should do a hard fork or not. Uh, and, and now that we have a soft fork way to do it, uh, it's, it's almost like a no brainer. It's like, well, of course we should do it with a soft fork uh, because it's, you know, it's just got all these other benefits. Right. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I agree, right? It sounds like uh, a no brainer to me to do seg witness. But that being said, right, it only lifts the, the, total amount for transactions by, you know, a little bit, or, you know, like it doubles it or triples it, but, you know, it's still a fairly minor increase. So, you know, I, I take it you will need a hard fork anyway. Uh, so why not just do it now? And like, what is, what is the benefits to delaying it? Well, right now, the network probably cannot take much more than two megabyte blocks. This is just like, you know, basic, uh, you know, tests that have been done. Uh, the, the, the general s consensus among the, the, the core developers is that going beyond two megabytes is, is probably, you know, too much right now. So if we're going to go to two megabytes, you know, we can either do it with a soft fork or with a hard fork. If we do it with a soft fork, and we get you know, with SegWit, you get all these other benefits that I talked about. Uh, you know, in addition to just the the, the block size bump, and also um, it allows us to, to to optimize for a lot of things. Like for instance, the the, the UTXO set. You know, the unspent transactions. Um, right now, with with the current cost metrics, uh, with just the block size, uh, it doesn't provide enough incentive for people to to clean that. You know, which which is basically stuff that needs to be stored on all the validator nodes. It's just extra data that gets stuck there. Uh, and with with SegWit. This adds an incentive to do that because this part of the block is more expensive. So people want to clean this up by spending these, and, and you know the, the the witness part is a cheaper part of the block. So so the, the witness part consumes the, the unspent transactions. So so that that creates an incentive for the for the uh, unspent transactions to actually the unspent transaction outputs uh, to actually decrease. So there's a lot of benefits that we can get from this besides just the block bump. And if we do a hard fork now, uh, ignoring all the political and you know uh, destabilization issues, um, assuming that we could do it safely, assuming that we could actually deploy a hard fork safely right now, now we're stuck with the same uh, cost metrics as before. We cannot optimize this, um, and we're not going to be able to do SegWit now without having to go maybe to four megs or eight megs, uh, which which is something we're not ready for. We need to we need to build up a lot more uh, infrastructure and. Uh, you know, better relay mechanisms uh, to be able to, to support those kinds of things. So this would seriously delay uh, the, the, you know, SegWit, uh, which would be a, you know, a very, very major setback. And I think that it would really uh, set back development, especially on like the, the second layer protocol stuff, which, uh, which would be very, very unfortunate. Yeah. And of course, I mean, anytime you, I mean, I'm a strong proponent of just optimizing technology as much as you can. And if you, if there's ways that you can optimize that and it's low hanging fruit, you should just definitely put that in place. And it seems that there's been sort of consensus around uh, implementing segregated witness as one of these sort of things that we should just do because it's easy and it, and it solves a lot of problems. But I, 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 above and beyond the block size debate, I mean, as we mentioned, it, it, it allows for so much more innovation and perhaps you know try new solutions that we haven't thought of yet that would allow us to do more transactions or, or higher volumes at, 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 uh, in, at cheaper costs. So, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it seems like there's really no, no reason why we shouldn't do this. No, I agree. I I, I can't disagree with that. So let's um, before we wrap up here, let's talk about Cyprix. Uh, sorry, Cyprix. Uh, can you tell us about your company? 
Yeah, so um, as I said in the beginning, I started uh, working on, on tools and libraries because I was writing applications for Bitcoin. Uh, and, and there really wasn't anything out there that existed at the time that, that allowed me to do the kinds of things that I wanted. And, and right around the time that uh, the, the, the multi-sig stuff started happening with, with uh, you know, with the, with the pay to script hash, I started thinking about ways that we could combine that with BIP32, which is the hierarchical deterministic uh, you know, key chains, and uh, create a platform so you could do, uh, you know, um, enterprise-wide security policy configurations for, for, for Bitcoin account management. So you can have accounts where you can create you know, uh, uh, Bitcoin addresses that have a security policy uh, that, that's based on on all these different uh, signers that you can have, you know, in, in your organization. Or it could just be, you know, different machines that you have yourself, right? You can use your cell phone, you can use your laptop, you can use a, your desktop machine, whatever. You can have a machine at work, you can have a server that, that adds a signature. So it's just having a really flexible infrastructure for that. Um, so so that was kind of the, the, the you know, the, the, the killer app, if you want to say, the, the kind of, you know, uh, I was looking for in the beginning, but but really in the end we're we're looking to uh, to you know uh, uh, we're looking at all these different ideas that are coming out right now, and, and I think that the, you know the the, the, the kinds of um, uh, tools and you know the things for instance for for smart contract uh, design and you know smart smart contract authoring tools and uh, you know script templates and uh, other kinds of you know uh, more generalized mechanisms for being able to uh, um, uh, to 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 you know to develop on top of this. And so, so uh, these, these kinds of things I think are, 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 are looking very, very promising. And uh, uh, with, with, this, with the whole, you know, second layer uh, network stuff, off, off chain transactions, lightning network, uh, there's, I think there's a lot of uh, um, really, really interesting things that, 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 that are happening that, that I'm really looking forward to. So right now we're really just exploring the whole space and, and we're really looking to see how we can collaborate with, with other industry partners and, uh, you know, try to try to really build a whole industry because because that's really what we're doing here. You know, we're trying to create a whole industry, and, and no single company can do it by itself. Um, I think that that uh, you know we're we're pretty well positioned to do this. Just you know, given uh, all the you know kind of the overview that that we have with with you know the what, what, what the developments are that are happening right now, and and um, right now we're uh, we're we're looking at. Uh, um, uh, we're really looking at it more of like an infrastructure kind of platform uh, based, uh, you know, solutions rather than just, you know, like we started with a wallet. Uh, we do have a wallet, MSigna, but, uh, you know, Cyphrix is really about the whole, you know, infrastructure and platform. Cool. Well, um, Eric, thanks so much for coming on. That was super interesting. And, uh, you know, I'm, I can I can join the consensus. I think this sounds like an an amazing idea, an amazing innovation. And I have to say, like you know, sometimes I was thinking like, well, you know, with Bitcoin, the sort of development has slowed a bit. You know, there's people don't agree on anything on how to sort of take the technology forward. And this really does seem it has the potential to just open up a, a whole new wave of innovation. In Bitcoin, I think that's something that's extremely needed at this point, and so I'm, I'm really excited about this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, we're we're super excited to see you know new uh, new ideas uh, stem from this, and, and we really want to get get past this whole uh, community division. Uh, we think it's silly for for Bitcoin uh, you know people to be uh, against other Bitcoin people. It's like we need to be united as a community because we already have enough threats from the outside, and if we don't stick together. And, and, and do this thing, you know, together. I think we're gonna we're gonna find that we're not gonna it's not gonna be viable. So I really hope that the the Bitcoin community can, can come back together soon, and you know we can really work on this together because I think there's a lot of amazing stuff we can do, and 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 I'm, I'm I'm optimistic on the future. I think that there's a lot of really great stuff coming. Yeah. No, absolutely. So th thanks so much, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Also, thanks so much for our listener for listening. Uh, so we are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network, uh, LTB network. So you can find uh, lots of other great shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And uh, yeah, we put out new episodes every Monday. You can get it on all your podcast player and you can watch the videos on youtube.com slash episode of Bitcoin. And yeah, if you're a loyal listener, you also you, what you can do is you can leave us an iTunes review or review somewhere else, send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and then you know we'll see send you one of those uh, t-shirts. So thanks so much for those who've already done that. And yeah, thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.